This is local law adopting a method for the abandonment of streets and highways in the city of Cortland. Uh, local law shall be entitled the procedure to abandon streets and highways. Uh, if anybody would like to speak to this, and then I'll describe it a little bit more, you can either email, or excuse me, send me a chat, chat directly. A <laughs> check it. The chat should be squared away so that you can only chat with me. And this is potentially relevant for a section of streets in our northern sector. So the public hearing is officially open. Do we have anybody present that would like to speak regarding the city establishing the local law with the state of New York on how to abandon streets and highways? That was the second call. I'm going to give it a little bit more time. And third and final ask, is there anybody present that would like to speak? This is a public hearing regarding the city's the potential to adopt a method for the abandonment of streets and highways in the city of Cortland. Seeing none, I will call the public hearing officially closed. I will call the meeting to order, and as usual, I will mute everybody, hopefully except for myself. And if you can all rise if you're able, and recite with me the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Start the camera again. Very good. We've officially called the meeting to order. First opportunity for public comments. If anybody from the general public would like to speak to council, once again, please give me your name in the chat, and I will recognize you. We ask that comments are directed to the city council if they deal with issues of city business um, and are directed to the council as a whole. Also ask that they are limited to three minutes in length. And I'll do a couple seconds to see if there's anybody that would like to comment. And then after that, we're going to have ward reports. Should we mix it up? Should we go counting up or down? Should we start with the first ward or the eighth ward? Okay. Give another second. And at this point, not seeing any potential speakers from the general public. Let's mix it up a little bit. We'll count down. Starting with the eighth ward. Tom Michaels, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. We had, uh, we had one instance here that uh, occurred uh, almost a month ago uh, to this day uh, regarding uh, a sewer line that was backed up from one end of Williams all the way to the other end. And uh, I want to I wanna thank DPW for getting right out there and uh, clearing this, uh, this issue up. It did, it did start to uh, uh, cause some backflow uh, issues with some of the neighbors' houses. <laughs> Unfortunately, one neighbor did have to pay for a plumber, uh, but they realized that uh, it was a it was a city issue and not uh, not his line. But uh, I want to thank uh, Oscar for coming out and explaining uh, this whole detailed operation that uh, he performed that night to uh, several several of us neighbors that uh, were curious as to uh, how you unplug a sewer line. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> it's more than gloves. Uh, very interesting, uh, especially when we uh, pulled the culprit out that uh, had plugged it. <clears throat> but uh, something I do want to state is that, uh, and this is something that Nick uh, also uh, uh, had mentioned that uh, whenever you have uh, an issue with your with your plumbing, uh, the best thing you do would be to call the city first and and have them come out and tell you one way or the other whether your line or a city line that would certainly save you a lot of money uh, from uh, uh, getting a hold of a plumber. And now uh, <clears throat> that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Troy, you're up. Troy. 
Troy, can you hear me? I'll try this up with work. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Next work, it'd be Bill Carpenter. I'll call it the sixth. Thank you. Very good. Fifth word, Jackie Chapman. Jackie, you need to turn the microphone on, please. Uh, there guess, you are. There you go. I've <laughs> been a little bit out of commission, but um, I think all is quiet. I did have a call from a constituent who is a little alarmed with the Elk Street, uh, We Go Street situation, and I tell her I look into it, and I did assure her that they're working on it, trying to get it that problem by winter. But I hadn't called to 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 verify that, and everything else is good. Very good. Fourth ward, John. Very, very quiet in the fourth ward. That's it. Very good. Third ward, Bruce Tightler is excused. So we move on to the second ward. Katie Silman, I saw you out and in, and I do see you, Katie. Can you see me? Because I can't see myself. I'm going to phrase that. Okay. I see you, but it looks like you're out on the porch and there's no lights on. Right. So, no, I don't see you. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the camera feed. But anyway, um, it is too quiet in the second ward. We miss our neighbors. However, we have noticed that there's a lot less trash, which, which is interesting. There are a lot of leaves in the streets, and so um, I hope that the DPW is still scooping up leaves. Other than that, it was, it's been fine. Very good. And the first ward, Kevin McCarthy. It's been pretty quiet in the first ward. I wanted to thank DPW for their work on the leaf and yard waste collection this past month. Uh, Hopefully the trees have cooperated and most of them have been down while the collection's been going around. Um, I also just wanted to note that today is Giving Tuesday and I'm always so impressed by the community outpouring and support for so many organizations and groups in our community um, on these days of giving, so that's it. Very good, especially on Thanksgiving, the ability to help others and may not be as fortunate is wonderful. Uh, that concludes Warren Court's Mayor's Report. I've got a couple of items here. First one, we're going to officially recognize Deputy Chief Paul Sandy. Hey, he put his camera on for us. So, uh, Deputy Chief Paul Sandy, 35 years of distinguished public service to the community. The city, um, we're pleased and honored to publicly acknowledge your dedication and commitment. Uh, 35 years ago, Law enforcement. Were you on horseback then? <laughs> Try. Because the microphone's not on. <laughs> you figure after 35 years of Zoom, you'd be used to this by now. <laughs> it only feels like 35 years. But Paul, we really do appreciate time and effort. It was great that we have people that uh, are so passionate and dedicated. It's, it's more than just a job. It's a... Uh, commitment and a lot of respects it's a lifestyle in particular when you get into administration with um, departments that have emergency calls at all hours of the night so Paul thank you for your time and efforts over all these years how much applause would be appropriate yes absolutely I do have a piece of paper for you we wear masks when we catch up with one another Second item, under the mayor's report, we have a conflict of interest waiver. Um, I've been advised for the following, and this is regarding the water sewer lateral replacement program. So, Vicki Tobin has pre-qualified for participation in the city's water sewer lateral replacement program. And Ms. Tobin's brother-in-law, brother-in-law, Tom Tobin and Tim Tobin. Tom is a code enforcement officer and Tim Tobin is a youth bureau, both a youth bureau employee, both with the city. So since Ms. Tobin has ties to the city, one of the requirements of the program is for her participation to be openly disclosed. This discussion represents that required disclosure. And if there's any questions or objections, you're able to contact Toma Development. Um, full disclosure, not necessary, but no relation to myself. Same last name, but not related. Uh, 
So the fact that Ms. Tobin is related to two city employees, we are required to disclose, and this fulfills that requirement. But it's also worth noting, and want to continually get this message out, that for um, home, properties that meet the low to moderate income threshold, will have the opportunity for sewer laterals to be replaced this upcoming year, 2021, at no expense to the home. That the city has received a grant. We are going to work diligently to try to help people replace necessary. And if it's not replaced in a timely manner, um, what can be very expensive infrastructure. So if you have questions, you're more than welcome to call City Hall 7530872. 7530872 or send us an email mayor m-a-y-o-r at courtland.org mayor m-a-y-o-r at c-r-t-l-e-n-d dot o-r-g Ford, I've had some this is I think the uh, well this is very good news we've had some requests and I am very appreciative of council's patience uh, we have the opportunity for our annual tree lighting and kudos goes out to our Department of Public Works and our firefighters that have helped to prepare the City Hall tree. If you've not been by, it is quite enormous. It's a very tall tree. And there is now a snowflake up top, and our Public Works employees have done decorating down on Main Street with the wreaths, and they've been able to work on uh, the numerous strands of lights that have been probably chewed by squirrels and had other issues. Uh, we believe we've gotten to the point where we are ready to potentially light the tree. And with that, the uh, proposal is for this upcoming Friday to have a virtual tree lighting ceremony. So how will this work? We've been partnering with Tim Bennett, who is the owner of Funflix, to do a remote presentation of the tree lighting. So the agenda would be as follows. This Friday, and the official address, I believe, is 158 Homer Avenue. It's the old shopping plaza on the north end of town. Uh, it's a very large parking lot that is owned by the YMCA. Noah Beck, the executive director for the YMCA, has graciously granted the city permission to use the parking lot. And what we want to do is be able to set up one of the Fun Flicks large screens in the parking lot. Um, show a short holiday clip. Uh, have the opportunity for people to have some free popcorn and when we get to the time when we light the tree have the countdown all told we think this will take 30 or 40 minutes since we're looking at a 7 p.m start parking lot will be open probably about 6 15 and the earlier you are there better in terms of parking and we want to make sure that we're able to accommodate everybody not having done a lot of these we're going to ask if people can be there a little bit early. Please do so, so that we don't have a huge mess and fuss with cars coming in and parking. Um, in addition to the tree lighting in a short holiday uh, video, we're also excited about the potential for Santa Claus to maybe stop by. So in particular, families with youngins, and you're looking for something to do to kick off the holiday season or to add to the spirit, the city's annual tree lighting ceremony this Friday, and we want to do it virtually. Uh, I do have a question for council. We have some expenditures with this, and we're going to look and see if we can't get some assistance, but is there a desire from council to potentially do something from contingency? I would recommend, uh, I've had an email exchange uh, with Matt. We're talking about potentially $1,723 from continues. But to do so, I would need a resolution from somebody on council. Next up, approval of minutes. We have our minutes from November 17. Is Ryan, there, uh oh, excuse me. You, you, you gotta unmute all the aldermen, council persons, please. Wait a minute. Everybody can unmute themselves, correct? Yes. All right. All right. 
Yeah, yeah. You're still muted. from November 17th, we have motion to consider filing minutes from November 17th, Bill Carpenter, second John Bennett. Discussion, any concerns regarding the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of filing the minutes as is, please say aye and wave. Larry, uh, Jackie, are you waving? Yes? I'm waving. Okay. Sorry. Please wave and say aye. 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 Opposed? Consider the minutes filed. Thank you. Jackie, you were on the ball. I wasn't sure if you were having a question or right. you were ready for approval. So thank you. Agenda item number one, resolution to transfer $150,000 from contingency to the police overtime account to release funding for police overtime that's escrowed in the 2020 general fund budget under contingency. Motion to consider. Bill Carpenter, second. John Bennett, discussion. For the general public, last year when we did budgeting, we had some questions we weren't sure. So some of the money that may have ordinarily been budgeted to the police overtime line was instead budgeted to contingency. For the discussion, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Terrors. Then item number two. Resolution to create the position of senior account clerk in the police department. Motion to consider. Jackie Chapman, second, Kat McCarthy, discussion. So if you did not tune in at our last meeting, this was uh, discussed and voted upon. We are filling a position that we will have a retirement and also with agenda item number three, filling a position that's been vacant for quite some time, but the job title is changing changing the job title, so that's why we are creating a position. So further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There it is. Number three, resolution to create the position of senior account clerk in the Department of Public Works. Motion to consider. John Bennett, second. Jack Chapman, discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Agenda item number four, consideration of resolution uh, to adopt the 2021 water fund budget. <clears throat> and there's a number of dates that are in there, but the uh, important information regarding numbers is coming up in a separate resolution. So a motion to consider. Bill Carpenter, second. John Bennett, discussion. All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Jen Brian, Brian, uh, yes. I hate to interrupt, but Katie Silman has to say it out loud if she can't speak on the video. I am saying it out loud. I'm just in the company of my colleagues. You can't hear me, I guess. Very good. And number five, resolution to adopt the 2021 wastewater fund budget. Motion to consider. So Carpenter, second, John Bennett, discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> we heard you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And for people that are not, Sure, uh, we are approving the water and the wastewater fund budgets. The city actually has three funds, the third one being the general fund, which is also the largest. So those are two of the three. We are not completely done in terms of our budget preparations for 2021. Jenna, item number six. Resolution pursuant to paragraph 531 of the city codes authorize a 2021 special wastewater assessment in the amount of $785,000 levied in accordance with local law 6 of 1982 to be applied to debt service and cause this resolution to be published in the city's official newspapers. Motion to consider. John Bennett, second. Bill Carpenter, discussion. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 And the opposed? Fairies. Number seven, resolution to adopt the following schedule of water rates effective April 1, 2021. Uh, minimum quarterly charge of $41.04. That would be no increase. The water rate for 13 to 499 units being $3.42 per unit, $3.42, and that is also no increase. Water rate for 500 to 1,000 units, $3.12 per unit. That is also no increase. And then water rate for 1,001 units or more, $3.32 per unit. Um, and that is also no increase over the previous year. So we have a motion to consider. Bill Carpenter, second. Tom Michaels, discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And the motion carries. Agenda item number eight. Resolution to adopt the following schedule of wastewater rates effective April 1. The minimum is $33.70 per quarter, which is a $0 increase. And 11 units or more, $3.37 per unit, which also is no increase. Motion to consider. John Bennett. Second, Jackie Chapman, discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. And agenda item number nine, resolution to approve kind surrounds for the annual stipend of $3,000 for the 2021 telephone system responsibilities for the city of Cortland. Motion to consider. John Bennett, second, Bill Carpenter, discussion. Was that the same as last year, wasn't it? You are correct. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed? Carries. Number 10. So we talked about the other two budgets that the city carries. This is the general fund budget discussion. And our goal here is to figure out if there are any changes that council would desire. For the general public's information, we've had three workshops geared towards talking about various departments and points in the budget, trying to figure out the most economically feasible solution. And the mayor's budget has been to council for a couple of weeks. The recommendations that if we have changes, if we are able to finalize those tonight, then we can vote on the final budget December 15. And if we want more time, we can take more time, but we will need most likely a special meeting because if we make more changes, uh, we'll need more time. Well, Mayor, if I may, um, Bruce Tytler and I would really like to see an additional person in the codes department but i take your suggestion that we leave their budget as it is and perhaps he and i could work with the fire chief and captain ten kate to work to consider what that position to nail down what that position would entail um, and then bring it to council so i'm willing to wait on that and work with the fire department on that Good. Um, might be best if we go through by department. So we are discussing code. Katie, thank you for getting us started. And um, so the recommendation, Katie, is that you and Bruce work on it and potentially have the change during the 2021 budget year. Yes, after January. <laughs> Further discussion regarding the topic of staffing in the codes department. All right, another uh, question that came.
came up, we had talked about the potential for blue bags with the cost going up. And this is two costs that are actually increasing. One is the haulers costs, um, labor costs go up. So our expenditures increase as well. The other is the potential increase that we're fairly certain will happen next year, maybe once or it might be broken into two points with regard to the county tipping fee, which we paid directly to the county. Um, discussion regarding blue bags and pricing. So there was, there, there was an original suggestion of increasing the cost of blue bags by 50 cents for both the medium and the large. So the medium would go from $3 to $3.50 and the large from $5 to $5.50. Uh, since then, the county has potentially pushed back when they are anticipating the increase in um, the tipping fee. So council, we could have the option of a 50 cent increase all at once or potential to stagger the cost increase at two different points. Discussion? But we do need to do something because the um, general fund cannot support the trash fund. And as you recall, we did take steps to make the waste disposal standalone. <clears throat> now the fact, uh, Mayor, that the tipping fee uh, isn't going up at this point, is it, uh, is it that important that uh, we need to apply a 50% increase <clears throat> if we can <clears throat> break even uh, with, the, with the cost of the blue bags in the program for 25 cents? Good question. Um, I did talk briefly with Chris Bistoki about it. Haven't crunched the numbers all the way through, but if the desire is to potentially increase 25 cents, then we can do that and revisit as we get into the year. Of course, a lot of this depends upon usage. So the number of bags that we sell, but also how compact people are packing the bags. So it's, it's a little bit of our best guess because if people are able to stuff more trash into the bag, our tipping fees are higher and our revenue might actually be lower. Bags are lighter coming in. But 25 cents for an increase from both medium and a large bag might be able to guess where we need to be for the beginning of 2021. But bear in mind that we would most likely need to revisit that before the year is out. Kat McCarthy. Just to get an understanding of the outreach that is involved with the changes in the cost, is there a lot of, on the back end, just as far as cost-wise, like if we're waiting six months to increase the cost again, you know, are we actually increasing our expenses or does it end up pretty much a wash? Does that question make sense? Do we have any other expenditures if we were to increase the cost at two points of the, during the year instead of at one? Right. For instance, you know, paid advertising to let the public know uh, that the prices are changed or any back end in the system that would add to the cost of changing it twice. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I think we're both looking at Nick Dovey He's shaking his head no. I was thinking I could not think of any. So. No, they actually, they buy the bags in bulk anyways. Uh, yep. And uh, I think they do that at a certain time of year. I'm not quite sure when. I used to know that answer. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, regarding costs, whether you buy the blue bags at the beginning of the year or the middle of the year, uh, I think the price is still the same. But I don't know if we get that, we get a bulk rate if we buy in quantities. Uh, only Nick can probably answer that. But we just buy a couple times a year when the, when the stock gets below a certain threshold. So uh, the, the cost to buy them uh, doesn't fluctuate based on what we charge for them. It's more of the tonnage and the tipping fee. Cat's uh, question is pretty good too. Uh, we've never done really any type of outreach that costs us money. Um, maybe council, uh, you, you know, council would announce something. We 
put some stuff on the radio, uh, but not no no official um, it, no official correspondence that actually cost us money. Yeah. I I agree with Tom. Let's go. We should go gradual on this, not all <clears throat> fifty cents. The only thing I would tell you is we do, I believe, uh, list the cost on our annual flyer. Uh, not that it hasn't been changed uh, before, I mean, the cost of blue bags, um, but I believe that the cost is on the flyer that outlines the guidelines for recycling and garbage collection. Um, so it, if, you, if you go with one number and then it does change throughout the year, uh, you might want to just, maybe we should do a little more PR uh, because the flyer that's probably hanging on everyone's fridge uh, with 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 the details might be incorrect later in the year. So there's also John Bennett. Yeah, I was just going to say I agree with uh, everybody else as far as staggering the price. Initially, when Chris brought up the blue bags back. Uh, two to three, four weeks back at this point, it looked like the county was going to be raising the tipping fees to ten dollars. Um, since then, they came out of committee there to do just five dollars beginning of twenty twenty one, and then revisit and maybe increase five going into twenty twenty two. So, uh, again, the price increase Chris gave us was for that full ten dollars. So. I have no problem doing the staggering and doing 25 cents per bag. And then, you know, that puts the emphasis back on the county and lets us wait to see what they do. Further discussion. And I think at this point we're discussing whether or not the increase in the blue bag prices would be 25 cents or 50 cents. So I'll ask for a resolution, resolution to increase blue bag prices, a large bag from five dollars to five twenty-five, and a medium-sized bag from three dollars to three dollars and twenty-five cents. We have a motion to consider the said resolution. John Bennett, second, Bill Carpenter. Discussion. Hearing none, seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. All right. Other parts of other parts of budget. Uh, we've had notice from town of Portlandville with regard to youth bureau. We have an annual contract, and during the 2020 year, our contract that we agreed to, I believe, was $76,000, and even though the city did make cuts in terms of services, uh, we had some employees who were furloughed, we also did not provide a number of programs due to COVID. Uh, the town kept their contribution at the promised amount, and heading into 2021, the offer from the town has been to cut that contribution in half down to $38,000. And there's been some internal discussion. John McNerney, the youth bureau director is here. Uh, there's been a couple of different things that we can do. There's a potential for increasing outside user fees. There's a potential for um, other reductions in various forms. And then there's also the potential or thinking creatively in terms of what ways we may be able to keep the budget balanced. And John McNerney has asked to give me the opportunity to try to affect the cost savings in terms of some of the programs and some of the things that may not be as active as they were. But the floor is open for discussion regarding the Youth Bureau budget. Uh, Brian, we need to have all the council persons unmuted and on video as best they can. Sorry, 
am I still not working? I'll see if I can. Did Bill step out? Bill, are you there? He had connection issues in a past meeting. All right, do we still have a quorum? Well, if you make it the meeting, question mark. I'm texting him directly. We've got six. Three, four, five, six. Yeah, we're all, oh, we're all set. We got six. Yeah, we're good. So the question on the table, Youth Bureau budget, and where do we go in terms of the potential deficit of approximately $38,000. I, I thought at some point that uh, John had uh, indicated that he can uh, possibly absorb that difference. I misunderstand them, uh, misunderstood them the last meeting. John McNerney, can you unmute? So there uh, I was. Yeah, I was on. Yes, Tom, you are correct. I did, uh, you know, after our discussion at our budget hearing meeting, um, went back and met with staff and took a hard look at our budget and made some recommendations. I sent an email to Matt and the mayor. Uh, I'm not sure if they shared it with the rest of the council, but my recommendations on where to cut and reduce our budget um, at the dollar amount of $38,350. And I spread it across the board so it wouldn't impact one particular program. I think I did speak that there's a lot of unknowns uh, early in 2021 about bringing people together uh, for a lot of the programs that we do do. So uh, I did make the recommendation that I think I could absorb that within my budget. John, I would, I would think that the next year, if you did run into some problems, uh, we could certainly uh, work to try to solve them for you. I appreciate that. And, uh, Tom Williams from the town of Cortlandville also stated if you know we get things up and running uh, sooner than later, that he and the town board would be willing to revisit uh, installing some of those funds. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, with the discussion you had with your staff and just with uh, the direction that you think you can absorb in the budget, I guess I just wanted to check and see, does that drastically impact programs or reduce programs? Um, you know, just from the perspective that obviously I hear what you're saying, there may be reductions just due to the pandemic, but are you foreseeing any uh, restrictions or challenges that that would pose the we might want to be aware of. No. So what I tried to do is have the least impact as possible. And I can, you know, give you a few examples, but you know, lot each annually we spend about $10,000 in athletic equipment, buying such things as baseballs and football helmets, etc. And uh, we made those purchases in 2020, but a lot of those programs didn't go off. So I recommended that we cut $3,000 out of our athletic equipment. Uh, we have a very popular youth basketball program that typically is in full throttle January, February, and March. Um, right now, basketball is considered a high-risk sport, and uh, unfortunately, the 50 boys and girls teams that participated last year will probably be put on hold until we get the okay to, to move forward with that. So that program, um, you know, you do the math on it, it might sound, not sound like a lot, but when you, you have uh, over 200 boys and girls from Portland playing, that's uniforms paying officials, uh, running facilities. So I tried to take a look at it and, and do it across the board. Um, our youth center uh, probably took the biggest hit. Um, we have had relief workers to open that facility uh, six days a week, um, but uh, we're not hiring part-time staff at this point. So I think we reduced that close to uh, $10,000 uh, out of that line. So uh, even though the youth center will still be open and, and operating. so. There's areas that I, you know, I, I feel confident that we can absorb it. Uh, however, if we get back up and running, which you know we're all praying happens sooner than later, I've been told circle May on your calendar uh, because hopefully by then uh, we'll be up and running. And uh, you know, at that point, uh, we'll 
need the funds to, to operate fully like we have historically. Yeah. Thank you. John? Yes. Uh, we've traded emails, so you know where I stand on this. Um, and I do appreciate you doing the cuts. Uh, my only thing is, again, too, as you said, hopefully, and hopefully for everybody, and with lots of knocking on wood, if the vaccines start to get out there late March, maybe April, uh, I, I would recommend you don't wait till June or July to go back to talk to Cortlandville. I would start to talk to them the end of April, the beginning of May, because once the vaccines do start bidding, and again, it all comes down to when they get to the general public. But if they get to the general public late winter, early spring, I think you're going to see a quick um, uptick in all activity um, in Cortlandville, here in the city. So I, I would not wait to talk to um, Tom. I would, uh, you know, talk to well, us. That's, that's good advice. And, you know, I, I will share with Tom uh, the reductions that we're talking about, the $38,000. And uh, so he has an understanding what uh, is being cut. And, uh, you know, I, I take him on his word that he will revisit this. And it's been a great partnership over the years between the town of Portlandville and the youth bureau. So we want to continue that moving forward. I mean, because those, everybody will see it. And again, to it all, all comes down to when the vaccines hit the general public. Um, once they hit the general public, everybody will see it. So, you know, all we can do is wait and hope, as I said. But again, that would be my opinion. Good advice. Further discussion? Okay, so the uh, issue is that we have a reduction in terms of the budget, $38,350, is that correct, John McNerney? Correct. So that would need to come out of revenue and then for the December, before the December 15 meeting, we, we need John numbers um, to reflect a decrease in terms of expenditures. I provided that with Matt Cook, and I believe you had that as well, Mayor. So yeah, that was uh, this is Matt. Uh, that was mailed out to Council and the Mayor on yeah. eleven fifty eight on November twenty third, along with the draft number two of the proposed budget, which reflects all of John's proposed reductions. I'll re I will resend that out tonight. We need to just make sure we're doing that in public guide because that was after workshop. Rick? Yeah. Uh, John, could you send me the contract with Corbinville? Yes, I can, but I, um, I was waiting for this uh, meeting to be approved. Of course, of course. Yes, so, uh, matter of fact, we'll have to come back to City Council uh, either end of December or early January to have that uh, agreement approved. Ag agreed. Agree. Just uh, I was just pointing out where I need to see the contract. Very good. Jeremy Chairman. Mayor, um, would that would it include the recommendation that was made to um, increase use fees for non-residents and discussion on parking fee for Yam Park? Is that all right? Is that a discussion? I believe that is off the table if we are solely going with uh, reduction of programs. Okay. No one considers that um, something we should revisit, even though it's reduction of programs as a back burner. <laughs> well, Tom, I could see the user fee for people who live outside of the city, but I'm not in favor of a parking fee for um, Eden Park. So at this point, if it's the desire of council to um, work with the numbers after the workshop that John McNerney provided, then the recommendation would be that that's, if that's the change that is desired, then hold on to that and 
wait and see how the budget numbers start to look next year and see if there's other adjustments that need to be made. So those are the hot spots, if you will, in terms of the budget. Um, we talked about blue bags in public works. The other issue, and it's what we talked or discussed earlier this evening when we talked about the increase, uh, or excuse me, the sewer lateral, the opportunity to replace sewer laterals. And the sewer lateral is the pipe that goes from a homeowner's property from the actual structure to the city's main line. And as Tom Michaels eloquently talked about, it can be an expensive proposition when somebody needs to have those replaced. And typically you don't know if there's a problem until it's a major problem. And for families, homeowners, property owners of low to moderate income, with the grant that the city received, we had the opportunity to replace a number of those, over a hundred throughout the city. Uh, but we're going to need people to volunteer to make sure that they sign up and take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, that has worked into the budget in terms of the grants and the opportunity to fund a significant portion of our Department of Public Works. Bill Carpenter? Bill Brian, do we have uh, any memo or a piece of paper, something that we can hand out to our constituents uh, explaining what it is? So we go in door to door we can actually have that in front of us? Yeah, we can put together something that will be fairly succinct and include the contact information. And appreciate really help a lot. Yeah. Appreciate not just the question, but also the willingness to help us make sure that we're getting word out. Because this is a golden opportunity. It's important with regard to the infrastructure. Make sure that water keeps flowing. And speaking from personal experience, it is a fairly sizable financial expenditure. And it's a good opportunity to get some needed work done. And for property owners to have it done uh, through the grants, saving them a couple of bucks. This is for people whose streets are going to be worked on this summer. Correct. Hopefully we'll be able to emphasize streets that are being paved, but at the end of the day, it will be open to all city residents who qualify in terms of the income levels. Okay. And it's also good for people who have rentals and rent to low income people. That is correct. Now, would we consider students low income people? I believe the answer has been no. I think it depends on their... Uh, Whether they're independent or not? I believe you are correct on that. We can seek clarification. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr. Carpenter. Brian, do you have any idea on the income levels, what the levels are exactly the money? Um, as to income levels? Uh, I've looked at the numbers. I believe a family of four is in the range. Matt, you always say this. Don't put out a number because then the number becomes a number. If it's not the number, it's a number. But, I think it just sent you a link to the flyer. Wait a minute. You did? I'm looking at the right one. To all of us? Or just Brian and... Uh, the way the chat is set, I could not send it to everyone. Oh, okay. All in the chat. Help me. All right, I'll cut and paste and send to everybody. Okay. And this is linked on the front page of the city website, although perhaps we want to add a header to really highlight that this is what it is. Yeah, it's a great idea. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, thank you. That's what it's saying. Yeah. Kat, very intrepid. Thanks for doing that. What have we got you to run for? Council's a genius. <laughs> so a minimum, excuse me, maximum income for if it's, if it's an individual, $40,500. Uh, 
Um, actually, here we go. Let me. Oh, too big. Let me screen share. see that? Yes. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Family of four, fifty-seven thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. It's going to save between fifty and sixty thousand. Avenue because of all the major work that is already occurring there. But in response to Katie's question earlier, yes, where we have other work occurring where we're paving streets, it would be optimal for us to do it then because Murphy's Law will kick in effect, we'll pave a street, and then somebody's ladder will fail probably a week or two after. So if we're able to get it done when we're doing this, it's better. Contact information. Applications will be managed by Toma Development, and their phone number is listed, and it's area code 607 And all the pretty houses at the bottom of the flyer. Everybody have enough time to look at the flyer? There we go. Back out and we'll share that far and wide. Were there any other topics in terms of the budget the council would like to discuss this evening? Is there anything that you would like to see potentially altered or changed for the 2021 budget? Kevin McCarthy. I believe there's been some discussions about the animal control line, and I just wanted to check where that stands. So. Yeah. The amount in the budget is $77,321, which is the, the amount per, pursuant to the 2020 contract. They have proposed no increases to the 2021 contract. So the budget equals the amount of the existing contract. So $77,000. Three twenty-one and seventy-six cents. And seventy-six cents. How much cat food does that buy? Uh, divided by twelve. <laughs> All right. So going forward, council the amount is seventy-seven thousand three hundred twenty-one dollars and seventy-six cents. will be on the December 15th, 2020 con uh, agenda for your approval after you approve the budget. Very good. Go ahead, Tom. Any other topics regarding the 2020 budget? I do, I do have a question regarding uh, the SPCA, and Rick might be able to answer this better. That, uh, cases that uh, uh, come through the court regarding uh, uh, dogs that aren't licensed or what's or whatnot, uh, does the SPCA receive a percentage of those? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, the, the only thing that happens is that we require a... Uh, that they they license the dog before to resolve the case, uh, but the SPCA does not receive any uh, portion of it other than otherwise is given regarding the licensing, but nothing regarding any court 
penalties. I would point out that the SPCA has taken on more responsibility at the same price uh, relative to a zoning issue uh, with uh, the number of dogs in a particular household. And we've had a couple, I would say three prosecutions relative to that issue this year. Uh, so uh, they've, they've gone above and beyond their contract originally. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Waiting to see if there's any further discussion from council. <clears throat> there, there was a, another item that, that was brought up, and I'm not quite sure where we ended with it. Was uh, <clears throat> you mentioned something about uh, uh, a curbing fee? Yes. And I've noticed that's gone down from 45 cents per foot to 35 cents. Oh, so thank you. Uh, the stormwater, I've been calling it a stormwater runoff fee, curbing fee is probably more succinct. The idea is based upon frontage, how, how much the property has on the street, there would be a per foot assessment or fee. And this would be money that would go directly into the infrastructure, be it stormwater, paving, curbing, make sure that we're able to continue to maintain our infrastructure. And what we've, uh, what we've determined is that the, well, with this past year when we've had issues with the state and CHIPS funding, um, there's no blame to be cast. This is an issue throughout, and as the state has had less funding, we've had to compensate by not being able to do as much. So for us to be able to be dependent upon ourselves and be able to improve streets and improve drainage, we need to invest more money. Um, two ways to do that. One would be simply increasing taxes, which would put it solely on the backs of the taxpayers. The other would be to put it on the street frontage uh, before every property in the city. So the proposal is to do it based upon street frontage. I guess uh, originally uh, uh, some individuals uh, 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 come to the conclusion that if uh, they had a, a corner lot that uh, that would curtail uh, from one end of the up wrap all the way around the corner to the other end of the property. And I understand that that has now uh, been addressed. And you're only going to be taxed for the, the frontage where your address uh, is located. That is correct. Well, my only concern with this whole uh, program, uh, well, I actually have two concerns. Uh, one concern is that, you know, we do have some residents who are just barely hanging on to their properties anyway, so they're, they're elderly. And my other concern is that, uh, <clears throat> who's to say that we don't set this money aside and uh, somebody down the road, um, other than yourself, uh, Brian, that uh, uh, sees this money as an opportunity to uh, offset some of the budget to the, the end of the year. <clears throat> how, can we, how can we be guaranteed that this money is going to stay where we put it? I can address it. Oh, you're muted. Man, I can't do Tom, um, this is like the sewer assessment. This will be supported by a local law. 
And under New York law, since this is a reserve for a specific purpose, the purpose is being stormwater. So in order for that scenario to work out, Tom, um, a future council would have to um, renege, not renege, uh, void the local law. Do you agree with that, Rick? Uh, yes. I mean, we don't control future councils ever. So, I mean, there's a limited amount you but a local law is a little bit more serious. It takes a little more public law, and there's a little more pressure on the council not to change things that you've done in presently. But you can never control future councils. No. But that would also, Rick, that would also entail then having to have a public hearing on that even, correct? Absolutely. Whenever you change a local law, you have to have another public hearing. So that's, yeah, that's one of the, in the way a stopgap measure not to do it because people should then come out to voice, uh, again, to voice their opinion either against it or for it. It is both at a threshold and an obstacle. I agree. Yeah, this is not a. Uh, it's not an action that I think anybody really wants to do. When we talk about raising fees or increasing um, what it would cost to own a piece of property in the city. We, we take this very seriously and we work to manage costs as much as possible. Um, expectation is paved roads and water leaving the streets when it's on the streets. Bill Carpenter. Right. Uh, maybe Matt can answer this. Is it road frontage or curbing? There is a couple streets in the city of Cortland that have, do not have curbing. It's road frontage. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure on it. That's fine. You keep saying like the word curbing is, you know what I mean, but it's road frontage. Mac and I talked about this the other day. We understand what's going on. Apologies for using the terms interchangeably. When yes, they mean different things. Someone may assume yeah. well, I don't have a curb. Well, it's frontage. Yeah, I, I might have to answer some of that to my constituents if that that was if that came up. Thank you. Um, How do you cut? How do we come from 45 cents down to 35 cents? Uh, the 45 cents was based on an estimate of 50, 50 miles. When we downloaded the GIS maps into our system, and you saw the calculation, we actually had less road frontage than what we originally estimated it to be. So what we're using now is the actual, actual road frontage for the 5,280-some parcels in, in the city based upon the, G, uh, the GIS maps. Okay. What was the average increase in terms of cost? I sent it out in an email. I think that was, was it 20, $22.19? Was that about right? That sounds about right, Mac. I could look up the email. No, I just looked at it a second ago when I knew the average number in the 20s. It's not terrible. Just to give homeowners a general idea in terms of what it might cost. You want to make, make clear that that is not per foot $22. That is average frontage average parcel right okay and then the last piece um well a lot of pieces to the puzzle in terms of the budget but one more large one the opportunity to offer a retirement incentive and this would be for 
uh, uniform department, so police and fire, to the tune of $10,000 for an employee to retire. And we need to know from council if this is something that is supported, and then if so, we can move forward with discussions about department heads and potentially identifying if there are employees that might take advantage of this. Yes, for me. Yes, for me. There's there's a lot to be said and a lot of opportunity in taking a incentive, and you know, it's a great big opportunity for potential retirees to look at. So yes, I support it. I do as well. I support. It. I would also be supportive. I'm not, I'm not totally against it, but uh, um, the, the flip side of this is that, uh, you know, I'm close to retiring myself, and <clears throat> the fact that, uh, yes, it is, uh, it, uh, it is enticing uh, for that <clears throat> dollar amount, but once again, uh, you're leaving behind uh, so many years of experience that you're not going to be able to make up by new hires. So there's is the flip side to everything. Understood and agreed. Okay. Other challenges. Brian, there's no restrictions on that. Is there anybody that retires in 2021? What's the deal? Is there any other restrictions on that or no? So, the the um, intention is um, for the police and police officers and firefighters. And I believe it's the moving year. It is not prior to 2021. Am I correct on that, Mac? We would like to get that out as soon as possible because if it goes into 2021, we'll have to prorate the $10,000 based upon where they're where in the year they're retiring at. So if a person retires on June 30th, it would be 50% of that. But if they retire on January 1st, 2021, it would be the full 10. So I think what I'm already asking that is a one-time deal for the, the 2021 year. Yes, sir. Yep. And the number of the dollar amount decreases as the year progresses. Well, this is something we got to act on quick then because we're running out of time. Doesn't that be beneficial for somebody that, you know, well, it's beneficial, money's money, but I'm just saying, you know. Well, with council uh, support now, I can go and we can have the conversation with department heads and then also with the negotiating units and affected, potentially affected employees to determine what level of interest there is and we can um, continue to make plans appropriately. You know, you take the fire department and police department, you know, it only takes a couple of people to take this to center and then they don't have anybody to replace them and it's going to be overtime. <laughs> you are correct. Which might defeat the whole thing if we don't have anybody to replace them with because we know what the overtime numbers can do. Using our best estimates based upon the number of employees that we believe would qualify, and not just who qualifies, but who it might appear to be attractive to. So we will commence, we will have discussions, and we will have that sorted out in the next couple of weeks. Um, is there anything further that council would like to discuss regarding the 2021 budgets? <clears throat> and agenda item number 11. So the issue that we have encountered is with the changes we've had with regard to staffing and dealing with different issues regarding COVID-19, 
Uh, we were shorthanded through multiple departments, essentially every department in the city. And we were, with personnel that were still here, we ran into issues in terms of some employees uh, taking accrued time, vacation time in particular. And as a testament to their dedication and commitment, we've had employees that um, were okay with not taking time because they understood how important it was for us to have them and for the city to be able to continue functioning with them in their positions. However, as we enter our last month of the year, you're going to have challenges in, I believe, three different departments where we have individuals with accrued time that uh, they will not be able to take it. And even if they were, because of the number of people and the number of hours, if we were to grant it, there's a potential staffing shortage where we wouldn't have enough people left to be able to do what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we ask for counsel because this will also um, obviously, there's potential financial implications, but a lot of our labor agreements dictate how many hours can be carried over from one year to the next. Uh, so we're looking at a couple of options, and the first option would be to simply allow employees to carry over more vacation time from 2020 than the labor contracts typically allow. Uh, there's a couple of other thoughts as well, but the idea is to do something that will benefit the city in terms of being able to provide service, allow the employee to continue to have the accrued time that they have rightfully earned and potentially use it, or potentially cash it out at a later date that will not uh, necessarily make it more difficult for the city to function. Um, so the discussion tonight regarding this is to check with the council to make sure that we are comfortable with this before drafting, negotiating and drafting agreements with individuals and with uh, labor unions. So the first option would be carrying over time. Max, do we want to talk about the potential for conversion of time to anything? Take that as a no. <laughs> oh, here. Uh -huh. There you are. I think you, you're going to be, each, each union contract has distinct formulas for conversion of accrued sick days into, into uh, paid up health care. I don't believe, Rick, help me out here, I don't believe any of the union contracts have have that formula when it pertains to vacation days. No, it's all relative to sick days. And I think what we're talking about here is just vacation days uh, because all there are no restrictions on carried over sick days in any of the union contracts. Correct. So it's, you're only talking about vacation days, which then I don't think that flows into a discussion on conversion for health, health insurance. Uh, you're correct, Matt. Absolutely correct. So and unless there are some strong concerns from council, what we'd like to do is to go forward with discussions and make sure that we are uh, giving appropriate accommodations and dealing. Normally, we would be applying pressure to employees who may not have planned it, hadn't done what they needed to in terms of utilizing their uh, vacation time, but recognizing the challenges that we all had this year and making sure that we're working together. This is, I think, best option for all of us moving forward. Yes, it is. Yep. <clears throat> I wish my company would look at it that way. <laughs> you, you got a phone number you want me to call somebody for you? <laughs> That's all right. 
and then what we ran into, Tom, is is basically we had six or seven furloughed employees that I think were gone from for five or six months. So they weren't allowed to use their accruals because they were furloughed. And then the yeah. employees, and then the employees that were actually still here had to pick up the slack because we had seven less employees. And so it created a situation where <clears throat> you just have, you have guys with an abnormal, uh, not, not an abundance of time, um, but probably an extra week or two of vacation that's typical for this, that's not typical for this time of year. So my question was, is do we, uh, we obviously put it to council, but do you, make them take it, which then we have no employees for the next month. Or yeah, that's right. And we still have responsibilities. Do you have them lose it? Which I don't think you can even legally do. Um, no. do you, so, it, so basically it's how do we handle this situation? Because it's, it's not typical for this time of year. Um, and, and with the situation that we had with, with, with a lot of the COVID stuff and layoffs, um, it's just a kind of uncharted territory for us. Now, vacations are budgeted anyway, aren't they? Um, I, I would say so. For, for our contract, you can only turn in a certain amount of vacation time for pay, and then a certain, only one week rolls over. So what we have to next year, so what we have is we have a situation where we just have people with more than that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I would say vacation is um, financially accounted for because you're getting paid whether you take it or get paid out for it yearly. So it is budgeted. It's part, yeah. it's, it's part of the annual salaries. Yep. Yes. Listed as number 10, but that would be the second 10. So, agenda item number 12 COVID 19 and response. Um, we are, and I did get some feedback from Kathy Bischoff at the county, one of our legislators, one of the city legislators. Um, and what we are looking to do when the state did their testing the last weekend in October, they came in and they were doing COVID 19 testing and they left what are called edit machines that are rapid tests, and they've left a handful of those in Cortland County. Uh, the health department has possession of those along with some of the tests. However, they do not have the capacity, the personnel to do testing. Uh, we may have, well, we know we have a couple of people and we may be able to train more our firefighters who are EMTs to do testing. And this could be a real benefit in a number of respects uh, to be able to do more testing in Cortland. So the conversation or the email that we traded today, um, we're hoping, hopeful that we will see more in terms of an MOU from the county by the end of this week. And the MOU, the memorandum of understanding, the county has concerns about having one with the state because it's the state's equipment, and then also having one with the city so that we would be able to uh, cover any questions or issues regarding liability. But the hope is that we will get there. And everybody I know, following the news, you've seen that there's been an uptick, not just in Portland, but throughout the state. As you look to our neighbors to the north, Onondaga County, where there are sections of the county designated in a yellow zone, and one of the few times that Syracuse does not want to hear the word orange, but orange zone, which is more extreme in terms of the rate. Uh, we do need people to continue to follow the rules and to follow the expectations. So I know that there's been discussion and you see it all the time on social media and people when we talk with one another. And there was a lot of consternation when the governor came out and said, hey, no more than 10 in a private residence. And 10 is the number. And there was a lot of, well, how can you tell me what I can and cannot do in my home? Uh, the executive order putting a cap on the number of people in a private home has raised a lot of
concerns for people. And my ask for people in the public is not to focus on the executive order and the legality because coronavirus does not care about what is legal. The virus is not concerned about individual rights and the virus is not concerned about what we think is right or wrong. The fact is, the virus is infectious. And it is infectious during the day, at the nighttime. It's infectious on holidays. It's infectious at the stores and homes. And Cortland County, the health department has reported, similar to other departments throughout the state and beyond, that small gatherings in homes has been a major conveyor of the virus between people. And we have, unfortunately, seen, I believe, five fatalities in our county from the virus. So how many people know people who have recovered from the virus? And how many people know people that were not impacted, that were infected, and were not impacted very heavily by the virus? It was a head cold. I lost my sense of taste. I lost my sense of smell. It leads to a false sense of security when we hear those stories. And it is frightening because we forget about the stories of the people who have lost loved ones. And there is a uh, city employee who has lost a loved one. There are people that we probably know who have lost either loved ones or friends. We may not make that connection because we may not know that person yet. So the ask throughout our community and beyond is pay less attention to what the law may say versus what science says. So if the guideline is 10 or fewer, and this is not a New York State thing, there are other states that are doing the same, I believe the governor talked about Kentucky is going to limit, going along the same lines, but they're talking about eight in a private residence, even more restricted than what we're talking about. And I believe if you look at the Center for Disease Control's website, they talk about limiting gatherings to 10. This is not a political issue. This is not an individual rights issue. This is a fighting a virus issue. And it's fighting a virus that is real, that has done a lot of damage and will continue to do damage through not just making people sick, but loss of life. And there's cases where they're saying people who have gotten sick and recovered are not recovered. So regardless of our individual opinions, we ask, pay attention to what is being suggested. And as we look to the future and we talk about, hey, how many people are we going to get together with for the December holidays, be it Hanukkah, Christmas, whatever it is that you celebrate, New Year's, we, we need to start mentally making preparations now. Because if we get to the week of and we're saying, well, I guess, how do I not see Aunt Ethel, how do I not see Uncle Rich? Well, we're, we're making decisions that may not be the best decisions for ourselves or for our neighbors. And I think that we are fortunate that the number of cases in our county has hovered on the high end at about 150 lately, with a high end about 160, maybe we get 170. But for us to continue to keep that number from rising and to keep the number of fatalities from rising, we have to take this seriously. So my ask of the community, talk about 10. It's not a request from the government. It's not a request from any politician. It's a request based upon the science. Think about your weekend plans, who you gather. And as we look forward to the end of the month and other holidays, start planning appropriately now. And it will mean some tough decisions for a lot of people. But as you make those decisions, make plans on how you will compensate for the lack of being physically with one another. And bear in mind that we should have some hope because the discussions as we see what's developing, we might be looking at 
a period of months as opposed to an undefined time frame, which it was back in this past summer, as we hear about the progress that different vaccine manufacturers are making, we might be talking months. So maintain your hope, maintain the small sacrifices in the short term, and keep making smart decisions. And we will get there and we will get there safely as a community. Anything else that people would like to discuss regarding COVID-19 and what we are continuing to do in our efforts to maintain a safe and healthy courtroom? I have agenda um, item. This is a little bit of housekeeping Resolution to transfer the remaining balance from the 2020 CATC grant to the city's trust and agency fund restricted in purpose to fund police overtime in 2021. So council, you may remember there was a grant that we received uh, from Portland Area Communities at CARE and it was to go to police overtime. Um, specifically, it needed to be done to combat drinking and driving, and the idea is that we want to hold on to this for next year. So if I can entertain a motion to consider the resolution. Moved by Bill Carpenter, second Jack, Jackie Chapman. Discussion. Kevin McCarthy? Is it safe to assume that the grantor was uh, fine with this? Good question. The uh, money has been dedicated to the city. Um, I can follow up and check afterwards, but the executive director that uh, we're going to be very good to work with. Chief, can you start? What was that question again, Kat? I just, you know, the source of the funds, the grantor, uh, were they okay with us uh, rolling it over into 2021? Yes, yeah, so they gave it to us for the specific purpose of uh, Combating underage drinking um, and, and drug abuse, uh, but with the COVID virus, there hasn't been anything to combat um, on the effort that we would normally do. It. So it would be more happy for us to do, use it for that purpose when things open up again. Thanks. Thanks. Very good. Further discussion. For John. John, you there? Yes. Very good. We need to text on the screen. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Hey. Any opposed? All right. Further business for council. Yes. Do you want to revisit uh, what you started off uh, the, the Christmas tree lighting? Uh, yeah. Thank you, John. If um, we can entertain a resolution transfer from contingencies, and I believe we would be okay with this amount of $1,723 uh, to fund the necessary expenses for a virtual holiday tree lighting ceremony to be had this Friday. And that would be a transfer from contingency to the Council of Professional Services account. Uh, motion to consider. John Bennett, second, Bill Carpenter, discussion. I, I have to say, I'm concerned that this isn't going to give us enough bang for our buck. We're talking about a 30 minute long event, right? Approximately, yes. And you said that the the total cost is three thousand dollars. Potentially, yes. So that's a hundred dollars a minute. And how many cars can you get in that parking lot? That just—I feel like for the same amount of money, you could show a holiday movie for two hours using the big screen. I don't know. For me, it just doesn't seem cost effective as much as I'd like to give people something festive to do. 
And due to the circumstances of this year and what we got going on this year, I think it's some things you got to just take a chance on and just move forward to, for the spirit of the holidays. And giving giving the community uh, an oppor this opportunity is something we probably need to do because so much has been canceled throughout the year. It it helps people get into their own personal seasons. <laughs> <clears throat> Not knowing the cost of what other municipalities have done, I do know from watching even news uh, from all the Syracuse channels, quite a few of the municipalities have been doing the first walk, and they seem to be very well attended in person as far as within the vehicle and online. Um, Oswego, Oswego even went ahead and still did fireworks. Um, the city of Syracuse is, I think, set to do it this week. Um, and they had talked about some of the other municipalities doing it. So, yes, I it's it's more than what I would like it to be. Um, but again, too, as Bill and Jackie said, it's a little something for the community. Particularly family. Families with young children. Yes. Yep. I might have missed the detail. Is it also virtual, like you can watch it online in addition to the parking lot uh, drive-in? I um, believe, yes. So that expands the reach as well. Further discussion. Hearing on. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Scrooge says nay. Yeah, Katie, no, I understand and I appreciate the concern. I, I get what you're saying. Uh, it, it's been a challenging year in a lot of respects, and it'd be good for us to be able to provide everybody with something between the, Dece between the December and the November holidays. And I think this will really be a nice touch that people will appreciate. Is there any further business to come before the council this evening? Reminder before I forget, we have had two of the three public forums regarding Executive Order 203, and the third one is this Thursday. Executive Order 203 by Governor Cuomo mandates any municipality or governmental entity that has a law enforcement department to do a review and to potentially uh, review the, how we give law enforcement. And as I said, we've had two. Our third one will be this Thursday. 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. This Thursday evening, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. <clears throat> we have chosen different days and times to best accommodate varied schedules because I know that if you pick one day and time and you simply replicate that, not everybody can do that. So this will be via Zoom and the ID number 892-739-1872. Again, via Zoom this Thursday, December 3rd, Executive Order 203, Opportunity for a Public Forum, and the number is 892-739-1872. Our goal is to hear from city residents and stakeholders what it is that you envision or would like to see regarding law enforcement provision going into the future. So we're talking about what do we envision law enforcement and how can we best serve the community uh, Chief, I think we had an email. Chief Catalano, did you see the email that we got as this meeting was progressing? About the survey? Yes, I did. Um, day one, pretty good response so far. 
Okay, well, I didn't have a chance to read it. I uh, just saw it ding on my computer. So can you give us a quick synopsis? The, 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 the letters um, for the survey to be able to link to the survey online went out yesterday, and she's already received 30 responses back along with some queries for a hard copy survey. And that's just day one, so that, that's pretty good. 750 letters went out. Very good. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I've talked about it. We've got three legs that we're standing on with this. The public forums, that's one. The survey that has gone out and we're starting to get responses to is the second. And the third has been the EO203 collaborative, which Chief Catalano, Deputy Chief Paul Sandy, Alderman Teitler, and myself have been uh, meeting with the Village of Homer, representatives from the Village, a mediator, and representatives from several stakeholder groups in the community. And that gives us a better opportunity for dialogue and deeper dialogue. And part of the conversation, we talked about how the state put forward a guidebook. It's 118 pages. Well, more than 118. <laughs> uh, and we have done, to this point, I've been very pleased and impressed. We've had good participation. And we are hoping that we will be able to put together some draft policies, proposals together for council and the community to review and that that will be something early on in 2021 uh, potential recommendations in january and we will be well on track to put any potential changes to council long before the april 1st deadline that the governor has established so i think that gets us where we need to be in terms of business for council and the community uh, it's worth noting that we are well on our way in terms of the budget process, as challenging as this year has been in a lot of respects, planning for next year has it's made planning for next year even more difficult. And I appreciate the efforts from, in particular, all of our employees and the department heads, because everybody gets it. We understand how difficult of a time we are having, and everybody is making adjustments, making efforts. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that we have department heads that are foregoing pay increases for next year because we're leading by example. And everybody in the community should really appreciate the fact that we have outstanding leadership in all of our departments. With that, I can entertain a motion to adjourn. Kevin McCarthy, second, Bill Carpenter. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Um, all right. Opposed? Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night everyone.